Hey team, uh, welcome to this month's town hall. Um, as uh, you may or may not know, uh, my name is John Longbottom and I'm the CEO of Westgrid. Um, uh, just to give you a sense that we're gonna really be upping our game with respect to these uh, town halls. We got a uh, quite a queue of, I think, valuable information that, uh, uh, that uh, we, we, we believe would be valuable to share. Um, but uh, this, this month, uh, we're really, really excited to um, have um, a good friend, individual, colleague, uh, who's now got a very important role in our, in our ecosystem. Uh, so Nizar Ladakh, who will, will, is here, um, going to spend most of our town hall uh, today talking about Endrio. And uh, he's done this uh, session uh, uh, probably quite a few times now. Uh, and we, so we're really very, very happy that he's um, agreed to come and spend some time with the Western, uh, Western community. So I will uh, introduce him in a second. And of course, uh, as we always do, we uh, provide a quick update on the operations. And uh, Alex uh, Razumov from our team will give you an update on uh, the upcoming training programs and some of the exciting things that are being done around Visualize This. So just a bit of housekeeping. Um, if you're not uh, speaking um, or asking questions, please uh, mute your mic. And, uh, and of course, the group chat is available. By all means, uh, fire in your ideas. We'll monitor it and, and hopefully uh, uh, get your answers uh, as, as, as quickly as we possibly can. So here's, the, uh, here's our agenda for today. Um, and uh, as I say, it gives me great pleasure to, uh, to introduce Nazar to um, our session today. Um, he has been in this role I think since October 5th or 6th, something of that sort. To Nizar, I might be off by a day or two. Uh, but prior to that, he was, a, uh, he was the CEO of Compute Ontario and certainly um, has a very extensive uh, background in, in, in the public sector and in, in, in research and um, health um, from, a, from a national uh, health services perspective. So it brings a lot, a lot of um, uh, great experience. And we're very, very proud and pleased to have him now as the CEO of, of Endrio. And uh, that's a big job and there's lots to do. And I know he's, uh, he's working very diligently to, to drive his execution plan. So just grabbing an hour, an hour and a half of his time is, uh, is, 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 is just terrific. So. Nizar, thanks so much for coming and speaking to our community. Um, I think we may have 70 or 80 people on. Um, so there's certainly lots of interest in, in, in what's going on. And uh, so let me turn the program over to Nizar and I'll take uh, uh, over, uh, or I guess Alex will take over once Nizar is done. Uh, but thanks everybody for joining. Um, by all means, if you have any ideas of, of topics of interest moving forward, please send them our way. We'll have a URL at the end uh, and an email ID for you to participate. But, but let me turn it over to Zar, who's the, the new CEO of, of Andrio. And someday there will be another name other than <laughs> Andrio and maybe a contest coming up, but, uh, uh, but I would really uh, love to have Nizar just address our, our community um, and give us a sense for you know, what, what he sees happening and in Nizar, I hope there'll be just a bit of time for some questions if possible. For sure, for sure. Super, well, great. Well, Nizar, let me turn the program over. I will, I guess I have to stop sharing. There we go. I'll let you share. All right. All right, well, thank you, John. And uh, you're right, I th it, it is a big job and I would be terrified if I wasn't enamored and feeling enormously supported uh, by individuals such as yourselves, 
um, uh, but particularly, uh, you know, all of the individuals who are working across the country and serving our researchers, like many of the people I, I, uh, I know of on this call today. So I will absolutely leave time for questions, uh, and I'm happy to, to try to answer as best as I can. But what I'm hoping to do today is really just give you an overview of some of the plans we have for the next several months. Uh, and uh, if you take anything from today's presentation, it's that we are sincerely looking for your engagement and your involvement in helping shape our DRI ecosystem. And, I, and I'm quite purposeful in that language. It's not one that will be solely developed by Andrio. It is one that it belongs to all of us and that we will all contribute to uh, as, we, as we go forward. And so um, some of the questions for folks on this call that I suspected might be quite top of mind um, are you know, some of the immediate things like what happens post uh, major science initiatives year five? Um, what plans, if any, have we had about funding the regions like West Grid and Calco Quebec and, and ACENET and others? Uh, and what is the role of regions in the new service delivery model? What, what even happens post uh, uh, RAC 21 into RAC 22 in terms of the, some of the planning? And so I'm hoping to try to be able to answer many of these questions as best as we can from the knowledge we have today. Um, but again, you'll see them repeated at the end with, with specific comments. And I'm happy to email this to John and share it with the community. Nothing that you'll see today is considered proprietary. Uh, and if anything, I would actually encourage you within your organizations to share it broadly so we can get the, uh, the message out there most appropriately. So um, what I'm hoping to cover in, in the time uh, is a little bit of around our strategic planning foundations, the transition plans, and then speak to you about one of the challenges that I think we foresee. And it's less about the technological uh, challenges that for sure will exist in our coming months, but more probably about the culture that I think we want to begin to espouse and, and support as we move forward and then uh, obviously leave lots of time for questions. So um, you'll have seen this slide or you, you will have seen this slide a number of times. Uh, and, and for those who have, uh, you know, I'll extend some apologies, but honestly, this has been quite purposeful in using this single conceptual framework repeatedly. Uh, if the worst thing someone says to me is I've seen that three or four times already, I'm actually okay with that because that means we've been able to communicate our message uh, broadly and that folks have had a chance to uh, understand how they can contribute. And so, the way to interpret this slide, and, and I'll also mention, we've actually done a, a voiceover and it's on our website. So if you wanna share it with your colleagues, you can go there and you'll, you'll have a, a voiceover walking you through this slide. But for today, I wanted to sort of orient you to the slide such that starting from the left and then moving over to the right, um, uh, the, the groundwork that uh, the Leadership Council for Digital Research Infrastructure, Cucho CIOs and many others, contributed to a proposal that was eventually submitted to ICED, Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada. And it was a, it was a proposal to look at re, uh, restructuring or, or redesigning our uh, DRI ecosystem. And to the credit of the federal government, they responded with over a half a billion dollars, uh, specifically almost $572 million. A portion went to uh, Canary, a portion went to the national data centers that exist, uh, and about $350 million was reserved for Endrio to support its, uh, its work going forward and, and, uh, and the work of DRI. And so between my arrival and January, I've had the pleasure of uh, initiating a listening tour with individuals from across the country. Uh, as of today, we, I've met with over 200 individuals from across the country. And uh, in speaking engagements such as this, uh, the total now cumulatively amongst all my various large speaking engagements is over 500 individuals that we've had the chance to, to chat with and to hear some of their perspectives. But quantitatively, what we're also trying to do is uh, a needs assessment around DRI. And the needs assessment is comprised of three components. You might have seen a call for white papers. And the way to think about the white papers within your organizations and institutions is we were asking for your guidance looking forward. Um, we're not looking for a detailed analytics exercise. Instead, we're asking you, if you were in our shoes, what would be something you'd wanna put on our radar screens? Something that we need to factor into our planning going forward. And so we're asking for short three to five page uh, white papers from various organizations. You can 
you know, organize yourselves uh, amongst the West Grid community to submit set, a set of white papers. I know John, uh, myself, uh, when I was at Compute Ontario and our colleagues in Calco Quebec and ACENET submitted a paper around the future of regions in the new Endrio uh, DRI ecosystem. Uh, and, and other organizations from the West like Triumph and, and others have uh, submitted papers around things that they feel should be on our, on our radar screen. We're also doing a uh, survey, a needs assessment survey. Uh, if you go to our website, uh, you'll see the bios of about 22 researchers that we've brought on to a researcher council that reports directly into our board. And they're helping us design a uh, needs assessment survey that will ask general questions around how are you accessing DRI today? What are some of the challenges? What are some of the opportunities? Um, in collaboration with the uh, ARC regional CEOs, we've actually developed geographically specific areas where researchers from across the country will be able to answer questions. Um, we hired a uh, survey design firm um, uh, to look not only at elements of EDI, um, but also uh, the actual survey construction. So there's capabilities based on if-then statements to sort of delve deeper if you're a West Grid uh, uh, individual to talk about the challenges that may be unique to your environment. And, and John and the team and others have had some input into, into that design. And then uh, the other call that we've made recently is a, a call for current documentation. This in many ways is almost in direct contrast to the white paper where we've said, instead of creating something from scratch, if you have annual reports, strategic plans, anything of that nature, please share them with us. We'll, we'll happily review them uh, as we start to understand uh, the issues and opportunities that exist in our ecosystem. Uh, we also embarked on creating a current state assessment for each of the three areas that we have responsibilities for. So we've completed a current state assessment um, uh, led by a working group uh, involving the uh, Canadian Association of Research Librarians, uh, Portage, and, and many others who did a paper on research data management. And we're in the throes right now. Uh, many of you might be, or some of you from this call might be involved in our working group around advanced research computing, who's doing a current assessment. And then we'll be doing in the early new year, the one for research software. And after all of these items are done, we're committing to share the, the outcomes or synthesized findings on our website. Um, uh, as I mentioned, there are working groups uh, represented by researchers and individuals with expertise in these areas from already that are helping with the needs assessment. But we're hoping to go back to all of you uh, in situations just like this, perhaps at a, a early 2021 town hall. Um, we're hoping to organize them or take advantage of existing town halls in both official languages at various time zones, where we'll ask you, did we get it right? Are there things that we're potentially missing? Are there nuanced uh, elements that we need to appreciate with regards to the needs assessment? Um, and, and then early in uh, uh, mid-December around timeframe in January, we're going to be issuing a large RFP where we're asking the uh, successful proponent firm to do three things for us. We're asking them to do a global environmental scan where they're looking at jurisdictions that might have things to offer. To, uh, to Canada as we, as we think about designing our own e DRI ecosystem. Um, uh, so we'll naturally compare ourselves to you know, the, the, or the countries that we normally do, uh, the United States, Australia, the United Kingdom, France, um, uh, uh, all, you know, other jurisdictions like that. But uh, in my conversations with many of you, some of you have said there are other jurisdictions where we might be able to borrow elements. So I had a conversation recently with the former CIO of Canada, um, Alex Benet, and Alex is really excited about stuff that's happening in Estonia. And he says, well, not all of the elements would be directly applicable. There's some really interesting things that are being done there and uh, in the area of DRI. And so, so we would encourage our consulting firm that we, that we procure to look at those areas and bring back some top ideas. Um, we're asking them to do a technological advancements review. And so for that, really what we're saying is, are there emerging technologies or existing technologies uh, that have the, the ability to fundamentally alter how we're thinking about this? Uh, easy examples to share with you would be machine learning, AI, quantum. Um, but those of you in the sort of, uh, in the more technical oriented work, uh, even hardware chips, uh, you know, advancements made by NVIDIA and others, uh, that would uh, fundamentally uh, alter or change how we might be thinking about technological adoption in the country. 
And then probably the area that's of most interest to, to many of you and including ourselves is the design of a new funding delivery model. And so for years we've had um, our ecosystem supported by Canada Foundation for Innovation Grants. Um, and we've uh, used a formula typically where it's 60% provincial contributions and 40% federal. Uh, well, we're asking the firm to say, are there new ways to do this? Um, I said has already signaled as part of their uh, funding for this work that perhaps we need to reverse that formula and it would be 60% federal, 40% provincial. Uh, in some situations, they're contemplating if you're a national data host site, maybe we're responsible for 100% of the funding. And so we're, again, asking the consultant based on their reviews to look at ways in which we can uh, introduce some predictability and stability. Because I think it's long overdue that we get off that roller coaster of funding cycles that many of you would be used to and many of us have been used to where we get an injection of funds, we update all of our equipment, we you know hire new staff and then try to run it out for about five years before we see that next injection. So how do we introduce some sort of stability and predictability? And then yet again, we'll go back out to the community. All of these products, we've insisted that the successful firm um, that we select involve uh, key informant interviews, organize town halls, uh, oversee a series of working groups that we'll be forming. We'll be looking to organizations like Westgrid and others to try to help us think about ways to engage the community to particularly find uh, individuals who perhaps have a lot to offer but have not been invited to, to certain tables. Um, and then and we'll be also sharing much of our work on the, uh, on the website and, and through various reports. Um, and then in tandem to that, in uh, early spring, uh, or sorry, early winter, uh, well, January, it's probably safe, January, February timeframe, we're going to be issuing a call for projects. Uh, this will be between 15 and $20 million. And I'm really pleased to advise that we're currently in the works to have it a joint call between Canada's National Granting Councils and SHRC, SHRC, CIHR, CFI, and ourselves. Um, to determine how we can begin to work together in supporting this kind of work. And so some of the ideas that have started to emerge from this are things like uh, unquestionably, you know, we've heard there needs to be a cloud-based uh, uh, project. So as we've tried to serve uh, the needs of researchers, you know, we haven't been able to break that, that, um, uh, that statistic of meeting only about 40% of the needs of researchers. So how do we go farther? Do we, do we potentially look at cloud as a way to supplement uh, on-premises solutions in terms of providing access? I've heard as well from the community that, you know, it's long overdue that we have a national health data strategy. Um, uh, you know, COVID, if anything else, has clearly reminded us that, you know, uh, diseases and infections don't respect geographic boundaries. So why is our data continuing to run up against these kinds of challenges? Um, I've also heard about a really interesting uh, idea around digital research uh, in agriculture. Um, uh, the University of Guelph, the University of Saskatchewan have long been uh, working together on initiatives around, uh, you know, the future of food or, or things of that nature. And uh, based on collaborations they've created with the European Union countries, we actually have a platform today that depending on you know, who you listen to amongst the infectious disease specialists, um, they're uniform in saying it's not a question of uh, if we're going to have another pandemic, it's more a question of when we're going to have another pandemic. And then they sort of decide between themselves, but many are saying it's likely to be a foodborne illness. Uh, it could be another mad cow disease or something along that way based on the processing uh, uh, and, and export of our, of our food based product, food based products. Well, today Canada has a leadership role uh, in that we could tell you in the event of another mad cow disease, we could tell you based on the genetic sequences of information we've stored on a research data platform down to the individual steer where that infection may have emerged. And so we'd love to be able to see that as a great example with scale capabilities nationally to look at things like uh, research software, research data management and advanced computing implications around uh, supporting important endeavors like that. And then more recently I've heard, uh, uh, you know, and I read a paper that came out of Computer World if you wanna look at it, which talked about the fact that our data centers uh, globally and, and particularly in North America, they now account for a, a larger carbon footprint than the entire aviation industry. 
So let that sink in just for a moment. Like they literally, our carbon emissions from our data centers are producing more carbon than the entire aviation industry globally. And so unquestionably, the environmental impact of our data centers uh, needs to be assessed and thought of. I've seen great examples at Cedar and at SFU, and I've seen examples at Laval where they're able to repurpose some of the energy, right? So from the heat that's generated from our computers, they're heating swimming pools, gymnasiums, neighboring cafeterias, and things like that on campus. These would be wonderful examples that I'd love to give some funding to to support some sort of environmental assessment uh, or initiative that we can then share amongst ourselves and, and look at ways to reduce that carbon footprint. But anyways, those are some ideas. I'd love to see more ideas and, and please stay tuned as we, as we announce that call and do look and do uh, use Westgrid to sort of um, uh, be engaged in the way we're hoping to organize ourselves around that. And so with all of this work, then in the summer of 2021, we're hoping to do our strategic plan in redesigning our ecosystem. So in parallel, um, in parallel to all of the strategic and, and planning work, we're trying to build an organization. So we're working with the four regions in across the country and Compute Canada to think about transition plans as they specifically relate to ARC. Um, but we're also working with Research Data Canada and with Portage as we design our new organization. And so um, before the holidays, you'll see an announcement. We've just selected our recruitment firm. It's Audgers Bernston that will be uh, advertising uh, three vice president positions and a couple of other positions. One, a director of information security. Uh, and the uh, fourth one, sorry, I'm just looking at my wall, is the um, uh, director of procurement and grant management. Uh, and they'll be helping us with the recruitment over the next few months. We're hoping to have all of these individuals in place by as early as March, 2021, uh, and then begin the transition plans with Compute Canada and, and our other colleagues as we begin to form uh, Endrio. And the last thing I'll say on this slide is the reason for the double-sided arrows is as we do our planning work, that's also going to have an impact on how we shape our organization. So we had committed publicly on our website and through our, our plans, a number of things that we were going to accomplish. Um, many of these have slid because I think the single uh, message I've heard, well, actually I've heard a, a couple of messages. I've heard Nizar go faster, move the company faster. We've been talking about NGO for so long now, let's, let's start to see some action. And then I've also heard from the same community, take your time. You don't get the chance to do this right uh, a second time. Uh, it's harder to undo decisions that you, you know, later on uh, think shouldn't have been made. So take your time, get it right. We don't want to spend the next five years having to, to undo some of these things. And so we have purposefully slowed things down. We have sort of shifted a number of uh, deliverables that we had committed to ISED around the design of our new formula or the integration of the various sectors. We've delayed our strategic plan and, and a number of other activities. And Partly the reason for much of that is we're taking a lot of time for consultation. Um, you can see the series of items now reflected on our corporate Gantt uh, in terms of the activities that we're, we're giving time for, whether it's needs assessments or uh, other you know, strategies that we want to put in place. So continue to bear with us. We, we are moving as, as reasonably and as fast as we can, uh, but we also are, are taking great uh, uh, um, attention and making sure we get it right. So uh, again, posted on our website will be a number of uh, some of the dates that have changed as a result of, of our, uh, our timing, but uh, we continue to move as quickly as we reasonably can. So transition planning. Um, we're working with the uh, Compute Canada Federation uh, and each of the four uh, regions, our, um, ACENET, uh, Compute Ontario, Calco, Quebec, and Westgrid to help us with a, uh, a transition plan as it relates to uh, the Compute Canada Federation. But we also have strategic and, uh, and transition plans in place with Canary around things related to research data management and research software. And we're um, uh, anticipating rapidly bringing on our colleagues from Portage uh, as part of our organization in the early uh, spring of 2021. Um, so as we're uh, formulating some of these strategic plans or these transition plans, um, one of the things I wanted to share with you is, is why it's taking the time that it's taking. So I've heard as it relates to funding, you know, there are easier ways to introduce some stability and predictability. So for instance, 
we, we, we looked at the funding by the federal research granting councils and uh, divvied them up over the last five or a number of uh, over a five year period uh, into the four regions across uh, Canada. And so typically ACENET has, has sort of uh, fallen in between uh, three and a half to four and a half percent based on SHRC and SHRC or CIHR, CIHR, CIHR grants. Uh, Calco Quebec generally falls in the high 20s, Ontario in the low 40s, and West Grid typically around the high 30 or low 30s, uh, high 20s. And so people have said, well, there's something that's been, you know, uh, consistent. And furthermore, if you were to add to that uh, CFI grants over that same sort of period, and, and we have more updated information uh, as soon as 2020, we will have updated information as soon as 2020 is over. But typically, again, these, these statistics are remarkably consistent as you compare them with uh, the way they break down by, uh, by ARC regions. And furthermore, we added, you know, even the allocation of Canada research chairs by province. And so um, mapping that by the ARC regions, typically you're finding West Grid in the, you know, to between 25 and 30 percent, Compute Ontario between 38 percent, um, uh, Calco Quebec at 27 to 26 to 29 percent, and ASNET between three and a half to, to nine percent. And so somebody says, why don't you just use those uh, particular measures in determining how to allocate grant uh, ARC resources? And that made a lot of sense. And yet one of the things that we're trying to do is not just um, you know, what we would call in the sort of uh, business literature, a, a, a lift and shift where we're just taking the existing and, and porting it over, but we're using this as an opportunity to address many of the challenges. And specifically what I would address is, while this might seem consistent, what it doesn't answer is questions around equity. Many of you have seen this slide on, you know, social media channels or in other presentations, which talk about if we, you know, seek equality, uh, in some ways we're not always serving the right communities. So I'm particularly thinking about Indigenous populations who've had inability to access uh, some of the research uh, technologies available, smaller, more rural universities, you know, in Prince George or, or in uh, Okanagan Valley or, uh, you know, elsewhere in, in our great country. And so what we need to be striving toward as we're thinking about how to get this right is how do we achieve equity that benefits all of the different constituent stakeholders. And so these are some of the things that we're also trying to introduce in terms of our overall plans. So um, uh, as we do this, we're asking ourselves, are there better ways to do things? Are there, uh, you know, are we being responsible with the public funds that are being entrusted to us as we redesign our system? Um, how is what we're doing proposed, uh, you know, better than what it is today? And so these are many of the sort of evaluative questions that we layer on top of much of these plans. So overall, where I'd like to end now uh, is to talk to you a little bit about my observations around culture. So in many ways, what we have is a system today uh, that I would characterize according to three nouns. And as I look at our opportunities, obviously there are much positive nouns, but, we, but I'm, I'm focusing on some of the opportunities for improvement. We, we have a lot of division. We have division between those with uh, sites, those without uh, uh, data centers, those with access, those without access. We have segregation, you know, federal and provincial. We have um, segregation of duties. We have segregation in terms of uh, access between uh, the humanities and, and, and uh, you know, let's call them the hard sciences, things like astrophysics or engineering. And, and we have competition. And I'm not saying, I want to make this clear from the outset, I'm not saying competition is bad. In fact, many of the processes we will lead through Andrew will engage a level of competition. But it's a, a question of what I would call misaligned incentives where we unintentionally create situations by virtue of the competition that staggers us and, 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 and holds us back from moving forward the way I think we can as a country. So I'll give an example where, you know, CFI has led competitions for infrastructure and, and you'll have situations where, you know, uh, SFU might be the successful proponent in one of the, one of the bids. And then immediately we'll say, well, okay, now share your best practices with the rest of the country. And, and I'm, this is hypothetical, they've never actually said this to me, but it, you know, things that we've started to sort of experience is, well, you know, it's our niche practices that actually helped us win that competition. So 
why would we share them across the country when we're going to be competing with those same people four years from now for the same infrastructure? And the reverse, you know, when we built Beluga, they would say, well, we looked at some really cool environmental technologies. Why would we share them with SFU or with uh, Cyanet in Ontario when we're going to compete with them for that same, you know, dollar, those limited dollars? And so those are things that I think were unintentional consequences of that competition that I think we can address going forward. So. Uh, it's my hope that as we go from today to uh, what we aspire to be able to achieve in our newly designed ecosystem is rather than using the nouns division, segregation, and competition, I'm hoping we start to use nouns like unity, nouns like integration and collaboration. Uh, Canada is a small country in terms of dollar value. It's the second largest in terms of geography in the world next to Russia. But in terms of dollar value, it's my sincere belief that unless we start to unite ourselves and bring ourselves together and collaborate and share our best practices and elevate our researchers, who I believe are some of the most uh, renowned in the world, um, that I think we, we're going to cut ourselves short from global competition. I think if we come together as, as regions in West Great Ontario, Quebec, and, and, and the Maritimes, um, I think we, we harness the power of our collective efforts to be able to truly propel Canada towards the global stage of knowledge economy. So uh, in full circle, I, I want to share with you a couple of the answers that were perhaps likely top of mind that I hope were addressed through the presentation, but if not, I'll, I'll try to be specific. Uh, what's happening post MSI? So Andrio does become the funding agency responsible uh, for the MSI program that CFI has held. So that's transferring over to us. The CFI will continue to have responsibilities for other innovation funding. Um, uh, but Andrea will assume the responsibilities for that as of December 2021. And so we're uh, looking for opportunities to, to ensure that there's continuity and seamless transition that doesn't negatively affect uh, the researchers. Uh, what's happening uh, post uh, RAC 2021? Well, we're, uh, we are already underway in terms of uh, supporting the RAC process through the Compute Canada Federation, and it's our intention to assume those responsibilities as part of our national service delivery model that I spoke about earlier in today's presentation. Um, uh, what's the role of regions in the new service model? I, I want to spend just a few seconds on this one in that by virtue of the size and reach of our country, it's my sincere belief that I don't think we can always appreciate um, from you know, Ottawa or from our sort of vantage point as a national organization, all of the nuances and the relative um, sort of uh, elements that speak to the provincial cultures. And so I do see a federated model continuing. You know, it's worked for healthcare where we have federal transfers and provincial delivery. It's worked in education. And I think it can work in digital research infrastructure where we'll depend upon the collective efforts of our regional organizations to bring forward elements that are unique to Western Canada, to Quebec, Ontario, and Atlantic Canada, the nature of their research going forward. Uh, and we very much look to them to helping us ensure that whatever services we're, we're offering um, not only proliferates across a country the size, but represents the unique cultural aspects of the, of the provinces. And what uh, plans, if any, have we made around funding for the regions and the host sites? Well, um, the funding model is going to be developed as part of the new service delivery model. And so I encourage you to be part of those processes in helping shape what could be working better uh, than what we have today. So with that, John, I'm happy to, to take any questions folks might have. Well, th thanks very much, uh, Nazar. That was really terrific. And uh, we really, really do appreciate you being so open and honest and forthcoming. Um, and we look forward to working with you very, very strongly as you move forward. You know, you've got lots of shoulders to re hopefully rely on. But as well, there's probably lots of people with lots of questions. And so uh, let's just take maybe, you know, maybe 10 minutes or so and, and uh, see if there are any uh, questions on your minds that uh, Nizar could entertain while we've got him. So you can just unmute your mic, uh, or uh, maybe I'll have a look at the chat. Uh, there was nothing in the chat that I see. Uh, so you can either enter something into the chat, or if you would like to, just uh, unmute your mic. I think that should work. Uh, may I suggest using the raise hand function in? Uh... Oh, there you go. There you go. I'm not a I'm not a regular Zoom user. Of, a, of the six or seven different tools we use. So that's a great idea. Let me try and find it. 
<laughs> I think if we, I think if we click participants, buddy, you can see the, there you the go. Hand function. There you go. Okay, here's the question. Um, are there any plans for collaborations with the tech sector, i.e. Amazon, DCP, et cetera? Yeah, absolutely, there are. Um, and so one of the areas, um, I'm doing a town hall next week with our members, but earlier this week, I did share a draft of our organizational structure. And so you can actually see that one of the roles that we'll be advertising for, I keep looking this way, by the way, because I have another computer, but I also have my draft org chart. I'm not, I'm not being rude. It's um, a director of international relations and industry engagement. Um, and, and one of the things that I've learned as we think about the cloud strategy, whether that's uh, you know, the work that uh, the Compute Canada Federation is bringing forward, but um, I've heard as I've had conversations with AWS and with Google and, and Azure and others that you know, many of them have said, we would love to be able to offer um, uh, you know, our commercial cloud. You could look at spot pricing, you could use your leverage as a national organization to uh, you know, set a, a sort of price that researchers can be able to access. In fact, don't kid yourself, these are there researchers on there already using it. And, you know, uh, it, uh, many of you will be familiar with that, you know, the bulk of a lot of our research um, that uses our infrastructure takes advantage of sort of large scale, but many of the people are really just needing something called burst capacity as, as you're approaching grant competitions or other things. They just need a lot of volume for a short time, and that's ideally suited to the commercial environments. But more than that, I think what I was amazed at is, at least based on my last five years in this uh, DRI ecosystem, we've spent about $350 million um, on, uh, on DRI through CFI grants over five years across this country. When I asked Google, what do you actually spend globally uh, on maintenance and, 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 uh, and systems? They spend $350 million a day a day. And, and so I sort of sit back and think, well, there's absolutely no way we can, you know, continue to expect the public sector to, to fulfill all of the needs. And we need to have uh, partnership opportunities with, uh, with um, the tech sector. And, and, and the last thing I'll say on that is earlier, you'll, you might be thinking, well, you said you're, you're not a big fan of competition. Well, no, I, I didn't actually say that. In fact, uh, in some ways, I think competition is enormously helpful. So when I've spoken to them, to the to the three, um, you know, uh, behemoths and, and the commercial cloud providers, they said, we're happy to compete with each other, right? Let, let's all set up a single price that uh, is affordable for researchers and for, for public sector. And what we'll compete on is the value added research uh, software that we offer through our cloud. And in other words, if, if postdocs are accessing Google today and they're getting their research done, the likelihood that they're going to insist upon Google when they go Google Cloud when they go back to industry or go out to industry is higher. So we're thinking long term. Things like cybersecurity protections, things like storage, those are all the areas that we're happy to compete with each other on. But you know, price is uh, is something that we we understand is a is a area that we could you know we need to sort of come down on it. And if you want to work with us, we're happy to work with you. So that was uh, I hope that was a, a an answer to your question. That's great. That's great. Thanks, Lisa. There's another question here. If we have equity in mind. Does this mean that researchers from Maritimes will be able to, as example, from Maritimes will be able to get more resources with smaller science score in their rack application? Yeah, it's a it's a great question, and I, I would say th those are that would be an example of how we would try to introduce equity uh, into our models. How do we instead of repeating what has historically always happened and simply regurgitating that and and solidifying, uh, you know, uh, our past practices? How do we think about ways to uh, embrace Indigenous researchers who want to, um, you know, I've heard of numerous examples at uh, USASC and Manitoba and, and in, uh, uh, in um, uh, other provinces where the digitization of Indigenous culture is something that has tremendous meaning uh, to our to our uh, uh, Indigenous populations, uh, but they can let alone, you know, they can barely get the sort of tools they need to do things like that. How do we, uh, you know, we've talked about social sciences and, and digital humanities. How do we actually elevate them in these competitions so that they can begin to proliferate uh, and think about new studies when everything's always going to, to one sector or the other? And, and it's, it's um, uh, the challenge I find is that it's, it's a, a fixed pie, right? So all we're doing is then cutting the pie in, in tinier, tinier slices. And I'm not sure that's useful. So 
I don't have an answer today. It's my hope that um, uh, you know that that answer will emerge from the community um, uh, as as we start to think about model redesign. Thanks. That's great. Um, another question. One of the segregations uh, that's seen is between the compute infrastructure available to federal researchers and academic researchers. This really hampers collaboration. Is there any thinking on this front? There is. Um, and so one of my uh, earlier conversations with the granting councils was how do we, you know, for lack of a better descriptor, how do we sort of uh, demonstrate to the country that the right hand and the left hand know what they're doing? And, and an example with that is, is one that really hits home for me and is close to heart where we'd have researchers go through their federal granting council applications and they would be approved, they'd be peer reviewed by, their, by other scientists to say, this is top notch research, we need to support it. They'd get their research grant and then they were told to go to the, um, uh, to the rack allocation process to get their infrastructure only to then be denied then. And, and who do they come back to? They come back to many of you to say like, this is ridiculous. How do I, how did I get approved for this wonderful research? And now you're asking me to go through this process and I don't get the infrastructure to do it. Like, how does that make any sense? And, and you're having to respond and that's completely inappropriate. So I, I would say definitely Neil, my hope is that um, alignment at the federal level uh, and, and even uh, looking at ways in which we can be, uh, you know, better support our researchers. So starting earlier, uh, having a situation where um, Andrio, uh, you know, scientists and others that are involved are part of that granting process and ensuring that we actually have the resources to meet the, the the grant so that when the researcher gets approved by you know CIHR or NSHRC, they not only have the approved research, but they have their approved allocations uh, as they sort of go forward. Great, we just got a few more. We all want to try and get them done here, Nizar. So is there a, any summary of the engagement results so far that's informing current efforts? Uh, not it yet, Brian. Um, it's, uh, I would say probably by January, you'll start to see the product of uh, much of that work. It's nearing completion. And uh, our researcher council is the group that we're sharing it with. So it's the 22 researchers that we brought up from across the country. So they're looking at current drafts um, or they will be shortly and over the holidays. And then we're gonna start putting some of the results on our website. And this is where you'll then get the chance to say, uh, I don't understand what this is about or what's this white paper talking about? And, and we'll try to sort of make sure we have the, the right information. Great. It's a statement here, a statement and a question um, regarding regional differences. Surely the more natural division is by science domain. As a BC astronomer, I have more in common with an astronomer, astronomer in Halifax than a genomics researcher in BC. Yeah. No, it's very true, Stephen. And so I think the way we need to self-organize or to organize ourselves are, are very much uh, in the ways you're describing. But what I loved about your question is you didn't say just with uh, astronomers in BC. It's, you know, with astronomers in my field from across the country. And that's very much the kind of uh, uh, opportunities that I think we need to be thinking about. So what are the needs of the astrophysics community? I mean, I know they've they've actually done modeling and they could use the entire Compute Canada Federation allocation alone uh, in terms of um, GPUs and clusters for the next four or five years. So. Uh, how do we do that in an, in an equitable manner and, 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 and continue to meet the needs of researchers from across the country? Okay, team, I'm gonna take just two more. Uh, so Marcus, you got one in. Um, what are your thoughts on, on investing in our current hosted cloud offerings versus commercial cloud? Uh, it's, it's my sincere intent uh, to be able to do that, Dylan. So through the, through the um, inaugural call for projects that we're doing, uh, we're not going to just fund one cloud initiative. Uh, what we're hoping to do is uh, fund a few that have promise. But um, the, this is where, when I talked about culture, we're going to use our position to try to incent and start to align uh, the incentives in ways that I think will be, you know, we, we as a community, a broad community, wish to see. So in the call for projects, you'll see evaluative criteria around things like, um, uh, you know, if it should bring together research data management software and advanced computing. And if it's a proof of concept or a pilot study, it has to have the potential on successful completion to scale nationally. And so there may be a number of cloud projects that, that you know, are submitted for our evaluation for the evaluation committee. The other criteria you'll see in there is if you can work and if you submit your proposal, 
through interprovincial collaborations. In other words, West Grid's working with Calco Quebec or BC's working with Alberta or BC's working with Manitoba. While it's not a requirement, you will score more favorably in the evaluation if you bring multi-institution, multi-provincial collaborations. And so, uh, you know, a cloud-based project out of one university versus a cloud-based project that brings together uh, a number of provinces and universities and, and such as the kind that's been, you know, already worked on by the Federation are the kinds of projects that are likely to get going to see success. And our, our last question um, uh, from Marcos regarding digital agriculture, which has been traditionally underrepresented in light of other areas such as omics. Have you devised or discussed any specific strategies for inclusion? Um, not a specific one, Marcus, and I would agree wholeheartedly with you. So let me share with you um, my, my tactics and, and my motivations for some of the things. All of those projects I described, digital agriculture, cloud-based projects, uh, national health data, there isn't one group that's uh, that sort of uh, has a domain or, or uh, uh, oversight in that area. And instead, what we're saying is, these are the kinds of projects that are starting to garner some attention. There seems to be a little bit of a groundswell and we'd love to support them, but get together as communities, right? USAS, Guelph, Quebec, BC, um, all, you know, uh, uh, Alberta in terms of uh, uh, Canadian resources come together in, in unique ways that can put forward a, a combined digital agriculture project. And here's the little secret. Well, it's not a secret because I'm now saying it in front of 95 people, <laughs> but here's a little thing that I'll tell you that I'm doing is 15 to $20 million. Obviously sounds like a great amount of money, but I'll be the first to admit it's not going to go as far as it needs to. But the reason I'm sharing on these kinds of forums uh, where there seems to be groundswell and interest is there also seems to be groundswell and interest with my federal politicians. And so my chances of taking the 15 to 20 million out of Endrio's budget and leveraging it so that it becomes 30, 40, 50 million dollars um, is elevating when I can give politicians and decision makers uh, an understanding of which projects not only first serve our core mandate, but also are, you know, let's be very frank with each other, good announceables. And so federal and provincial politicians will want to say, hey, we've supported uh, digital agriculture with benefits to Saskatchewan, Alberta, Manitoba. That's a thing that people like to hear. We've supported the fisheries industry. We've supported oceans networking and, and things in, in Atlantic Canada. We've done a cloud-based project um, that you know cuts across five or six provinces. So Environment Canada, Health Canada, Kai Hai, Statistics Canada, these are all organizations that are coming to the table, not only to volunteer their time as advisors on these calls and, and these projects and lend their expertise, but leverage some of their own resources to, to help collectively lobby the federal government to say, this digital agriculture project is really showing promise. Uh, perhaps we can tap on the door or knock on the door at Environment Canada to see if they wanna to contribute towards some of these kinds of things. So th this is my hope and fingers crossed it will work uh, uh, as we go forward. Yes, our thanks so much, first of all, for being very open and providing us with this really important information. And secondly, fielding uh, these questions. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. We appreciate your time today. And uh, you can just count on us being active participants and helping you move the strategy forward. So on behalf of the Western Canadian research and support team, thanks very much. Thank you, everyone. Great. Alex, uh, we'll turn it over to Alex for a quick uh, update on uh, on training, and then I'll end it off with a uh, just a statement of our next town hall. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thanks, Can you see my my shared screen? Uh, yep. Okay, great. So I'm going to talk about uh, several training programs and events uh, that we'll have in uh, in the new year. So first, I'll start with the webinars. And uh, we've been running webinar series in WestGrid for uh, quite a few years now. So we just wrapped up the uh, fall webinar series and everything is has been recorded. So you can watch the recordings online. Uh, there is a link uh, at the top of this page. And actually, let me paste the link into the chat. So I'll mention a number of uh, websites. So you can actually either copy this from the chat or just uh, click on links in the chat. 
So uh, this link at the top takes you to the Training Materials website, uh, events for 2021. And then if you click on events uh, in the top menu and then select the year or season, it will take you uh, to the list of webinars for, let's say, last fall. Then you click on individual webinar. You can watch your recording slides, etc. So we'll resume the webinar uh, series in 21 we're on January 20th, and then we'll have uh, we'll have 10 webinars that we're currently planning. So the list is not finalized. Uh, we'll finalize it by early January, and then anytime in January, you can simply go to this website and then click on any event, register, receive the Zoom, uh, Zoom link, etc. And of course, if you want to see any particular topic covered in our webinars, simply send us email at training at westgrid.ca. We're always looking for topic suggestions uh, and uh, we'll, 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 we'll be happy to accommodate your request. Uh, next, I'll talk about other online training. Uh, so we've been collaborating with UBC Research Commons for the past year. Uh, we do monthly webinar, uh, well, now there are online workshops for them. Uh, so these are usually quite interactive workshops where participants go through a series of exercises. And um, we're planning the same for 21. So the first one is gonna be uh, on January 14th and then uh, we'll do it monthly. And the links to these are also on the same website, the Training Materials website. So again, we're tr now uh, working on the schedule. So this will be finalized by January. And then uh, this is open to all researchers across the country, not just UBC researchers. Uh, then if you're at the University of Alberta, uh, the research computing folks at the U of A are planning their own uh, online uh, research computing bootcamp. Uh, this is gonna be over four weeks in February. So right now I don't have the link, but if you are at the UV, you can just uh, go to the research computing website and I'm sure there will be a link published there shortly. So the big event in Westgrid is the training modules that we're gonna start in April. Uh, so this is another version of our, uh, uh, well, spring and summer schools. So we've been running summer schools for quite a while now and then shorter schools in, uh, in the fall, winter. Uh, so we're gonna do it slightly differently uh, this time starting in April. Uh, we're going to have uh, at least four different modules. Uh, so beginner module, a parallel computing module, machine learning and visualization. And each of them will have uh, a few courses. And then uh, all participants, uh, so anybody from any Canadian university can register for a module. And then once they register for any module, uh, they can attend any course or any number of courses inside that module. So if you want to register for, uh, let's say, beginner's course and then a parallel computing course, uh, you just need to register for, for both modules and then attend any course in, in that module. So we're still working on this program. This is gonna start likely in April. And then in March, we'll announce the registration, the program, the website, et cetera, et cetera. And right now we don't know whether we'll have the summer school yet because well, that depends on obviously the pandemic details, et cetera. But uh, depending on how the summer, well, how, wh whether we can organize a summer school in person or not. So this will obviously have an effect on, on these training modules. Oops. Uh, Compute Canada Humanities and Social Sciences series. So this is uh, something that is organized by Compute Canada, our umbrella, our parent organization, and it's a country-wide event. So uh, over four days in February uh, during the reading week, uh, we'll have eight mini courses and we just put up a website for this. So the website now is just bare bones, but we'll add more, more information there. So the program is there already, uh, but uh, basically humanities, social sciences researchers uh, we'll, we'll be able to attend uh, these mini, mini courses and they cover a range of subjects. So watch this website and our emails for uh, registration updates. Now, next big event is um, uh, NVIDIA Hackathon at SFU. So this follows uh, two, um, uh, two boot camps. So in uh, November and in December, we had uh, two boot camps uh, at SFU organized by NVIDIA. Uh, these were online events covering uh, machine learning with TensorFlow and uh, open ACC programming. So in February and March, we'll have uh, the official NVIDIA hackathon and it's open to teams from anywhere, uh, from uh, all, all over the country. So we're looking for uh, uh, six to 10 teams, maybe three, four people uh, in each team. And uh, the idea is that each team will work on porting their code, uh, their CPU on the code to GPU. Uh, so we're looking primarily for people who are only starting to get into GPU programming. So who have a, let's say, medium-sized code that's been consuming cycles on Compute Canada clusters, and uh, and it can, you know, uh, be, be accelerated on a GPU. So we're not limited to only one programming model. So we can do, uh, well, we can look into parallelization with CUDA, OpenACC, uh, you know, Python libraries, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, uh, 
right now we're looking for, for teams. So uh, I think in the next few days, we'll actually send an email with a call for applications, <clears throat> but now you can go to this website and uh, fill in the form. So if you're interested in, uh, in uh, porting your code to GPU and uh, getting help from NVIDIA and from us, um, feel free to go to this website, fill an application. And so the call for applications will close on January 13th. And then uh, the following week, we're gonna select the teams to participate in the hackathon. And then early February, we'll find a secure mentor for each team. We'll start some, uh, well, we'll start running the codes and testing the codes first on CPUs and then uh, checking uh, which, or which uh, GPU, uh, GPU porting strategy works best for this code. And then the official hackathon is gonna run from February 22nd to March the 3rd. And so the last thing I'm gonna talk about is the um, scientific visualization contest. So as you know, for the past four years, since 2016, we've been running uh, the visualized contest in, uh, com in com Westbridge and Compute Canada. And this year and next year, we're partnering with IEEE. So actually hosting uh, their uh, international contest. So the idea is, uh, I mean, the idea is the same. It's the, uh, we have a data set. We are providing this data set and now it's already uh, published, available for downloading. So if you go to this website, that I put into the chat and uh, you see on the slide, you can download the data set now. So the data set is from a team, uh, a research team uh, from the University of Toronto. And it's a model, numerical model of Earth's mantle convection uh, that was run on Niagara cluster in Toronto. And uh, the data set itself is quite small in the sense that you can actually visualize it entirely on your own computer. You don't need any HPC resources. But this the idea is we want people uh, from anywhere, you know, not necessarily associated with academic institutions uh, to, to be able to visualize it on their computer. But of course, the, the primary audience is, is uh, people who want to learn these uh, visualization techniques uh, in, in, uh, and who are associated with Canadian universities. So anyway, the data set is available now. And the deadline for submissions is uh, July 31st. So you have uh, you know, more than six months to work on this data set. But if you're interested, I encourage you to start looking into this early because uh, there are actually quite a lot of things to look into. So the idea is not just to download the data set and try to open, you know, pair of your visit load the data set and try to visualize it. So there is much more to it. And the winners uh, of the competition, so we'll, uh, we'll judge all competitions in August. And the winners will be invited to uh, present at next year's IEEE visualization conference in October. Uh, it could be online, could be in person in, in New Orleans, we don't know yet, but uh, we'll, we'll invite the winners to present at the conference and the top winner will be invited to submit a paper describing their techniques and, and their findings uh, to the, um, to the uh, conference proceedings journal. Uh, so if you have any questions about anything that you saw today, uh, feel free to send an email, uh, um, info at westgrid.ca, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. So on that note, I'll pass the microphone back to John, and uh, John will talk about the next town hall. Great. Well, th thanks very much, Alex. Really great. Really appreciate you giving us that update. Lots of exciting things going on. Uh, I just want to mention that we're going to step up our game here and uh, try to do our town halls more frequently, uh, maybe on a monthly basis. We've got the next one coming up in early February. Topic will be artificial intelligence um, and the good work that's being done in Western Canada, anchored by um, a, a discussion with the CEO of Amy. And we're just in some conversations with other uh, efforts that are underway. So look forward to um, that that date. It'll probably be early in February. And uh, we look forward to, uh, to seeing you there. And of course, if you have any other questions or comments, uh, by all means, uh, just get to us. And we, we'd be very pleased to uh, try to get together the proper programs, the right programs for you. Um, but uh, look forward to uh, a lot more town halls and if there are topics of interest, by all means, get those to us. So thanks very much for spending the time with us today. Um, we greatly appreciate your engagement. We had close to 100 people today. Um, so thanks very much. And uh, for everybody who we might not talk to, have a terrific holiday season, albeit it's being governed by that uh, pesky pandemic issue that we've all been living through for 2020. But um, I think there's a, a light at the end of the tunnel and it's, uh, it's not a freight train coming our way. So have a wonderful holiday season and we'll see you uh, very early in the new year. Thanks very much, everybody. Have a great day. Have a great weekend.